Good morning again, Redeemer family. If you have your Bibles, I'd invite you to turn to Psalm 111. We're making our way through some of the Psalms in the summer, as is our habit here at Redeemer. And this morning, we're going to consider Psalm 111. I've entitled, uh, or the way I want to frame our time uh, this morning, is to look at this Psalm as a Psalm that helps us to worship the Lord. A Psalm that helps us to worship the Lord. I'll read it. Praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the company of the upright in the congregation. Great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who delight in them. Full of splendor and majesty is his work, and his righteousness endures forever. He has caused his wondrous works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and merciful. He provides food for those who fear him. He remembers his covenant forever. He has shown his people the power of his works in giving them the inheritance of the nations. The works of his hands are faithful and just. All his precepts are trustworthy. They are established forever and ever to be performed with faithfulness and uprightness. He sent redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All those who practice it have a good understanding. His praises endure forever. Let's pray. Father, uh, thank you for the reading of your word and the privilege we have to open it up. Father, you speak preeminently through the reading of scripture and you also speak through uh, our time reflecting upon it. Would you build your people up? Would you aid us in our worship? Would you cause us, Lord, to remember the wondrous works of our God and King? Forgive us our sins, even the sins of your servant. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So uh, there's a song that's written by Shai Lin, and it's a, it's a rap song. And um, I'll frame it, and then I'll put the lyrics in front of you. So the song is three verses long, and there's a hook, and every verse uh, recounts the last minutes of someone's life. And so you meet three different men in the song. One is Mr. Smith, one is Mr. Jones, and one is Mr. Michaels, and they're all in the hospital about to die. And each verse captures their inner monologue moments before they die. Mr. Smith is wrestling with assurance. Mr. Michaels is an outright rebel until he dies. But Mr. Jones is the one that is ready for death. Greg is going to put the lyrics up and I'm going to read them to you. Life was quick, but these last breaths seem the longest. I'm on the brink of entering everything that you promised. My heart skips thinking of what I'll be in a moment. This joy is undeniably the precious fruit of the atonement. The cross of Christ, his awesome price and your grace, they carried me. In just a few breaths, I'll walk into a marriage feast and taste of your goodness without getting a cavity. Your majesty will light up the city that will inhabit and the lamb will be the lamp in the middle. There'll be no PM. I tremble at the fact that I'll be captured by the blazing glory of the one that I've been waiting to see. And I'll see him to see his face and worship perpetually won't be boring because this flesh won't be a hitch anymore. I'll be restored to new morning after morning, all because you bled death. I'll leave here on this hospital bed. My life was long and I'm ready to go. I stood strong and I'm ready to go. I can't wait to sing along with the throng up in heaven, you know. It's where I belong. I'm ready to go. Thank you. Did you notice that last line? I can't wait to sing along with the throng of believers up in heaven, you know. It's where I belong. I'm ready to go. Did, did you get what he's saying? 
He's declaring that we were created to worship and enjoy the Lord. In fact, when we're brought into the presence of Jesus, not only will we be perfected, but our worship and enjoyment of Jesus will be perfected. But did you also notice the other line in the song? He says to see his face and worship perpetually, it won't be boring because this flesh won't be a hitch anymore. I'll be restored. The artist is also delivering sobering news that while we were made to worship and enjoy the Lord, it's not always easy to do so. In fact, it's easy to be bored in worship, distracted in worship, to minimize the importance of worship, to have divided hearts in worship, to only show up for worship because our parents or coaches are making us go to worship or to appease our spouses or to make ourselves look good in the standing of others. And so we go to church. Mr. Jones welcomes death because it will be the end of the struggle to worship God rightly and beautifully and wholeheartedly. Can you relate to this phenomenon that he mentions in his song, The Tension? You know God is seeking worshipers who will worship him in spirit and in truth. You watch countless people across the ages show up to church Sunday after Sunday. You drive down Northside Drive, State Street, up 55, and you pass these churches and you see people gather. So something inside of you tells you that something that happens is sacred and special. And you also know that your flesh is a hitch. It joins itself to distractions to idols, to boredom, to long Saturday nights that make us tired on Sundays, to viewing the Lord's day as a day to sleep in, it hitches itself to excuses to do everything but show up regularly in the worship of God. And if this is you, which I'm certain it has been at times, our psalm this morning was written to help you do what you were created to do. And that's to worship our God and King with passion and regularity, to do it robustly and wholeheartedly and correctly. And I think this psalm is to help us. Now, before we jump in the text, two observations. You can't see it in your English Bibles, but if you had a Hebrew Bible, which is what the Old Testament was written in, then you would know that Psalm 111 is an acrostic. All right? Here's what that means. That means once you get past the first verse, praise the Lord, that that phrase, I will give thanks to the Lord, begins with the Hebrew alphabet Aleph, which is A. In the company of the upright begins with the second Hebrew alphabet. And great are the works. The word great begins with the third Hebrew alphabet until the psalmist goes through every single Hebrew alphabet. And so what you see happening here is this would help people memorize the psalm. If you knew that the next verse begins with B and then C and then D and then E, you, you could recall the psalm. So it helps there. But the other reason uh, the poets would use acrostics it's because really when you think about it, y'all, like we could go on and on and on and on about God's goodnesses, can't we? What an acrostic does is it constrains the writer. I can't say everything I want to say or could say, but what, what I will say is from the A to the T in the Hebrew alphabet, this is what I'm constraining the goodness of God to the alphabet. That, that's a way, that, that's a reason they would use it. But here's the second thing to note about Psalm 111. It's one part of the whole of Psalm 112. In other words, you have to read Psalm 111 and then read Psalm 112 to get the clear picture of what the psalmist is doing. Now notice, how many verses do you see in Psalm 111? 10. Well, how many verses are in Psalm 112? 12, right? You also notice that vocabulary is very similar. Look at how Psalm 111 ends. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. 
Well, look at how Psalm 112 begins. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, right? And so what you see is that these things are, being, are meant to be written together. And what Psalm 111 does, it says, hey, God is worthy of your worship. And what Psalm 112 does, when you worship and fear the Lord, you will become like the God you're worshiping. And so next week, we're going to look at Psalm 112. And you're going to see that these attributes about God that exist in Psalm 11, they begin to show itself up in the life of true worshipers of Yahweh. We become like the thing that we behold. If you behold him and worship him, over time, you begin to look like him. Now, but that's not where we are today. We're at Psalm 111. The first thing you see in this psalm is a command to worship him. Now, notice how the, the passage begins. It begins with praise the Lord. In the Hebrew, praise the Lord is really one word. It's where we get our word hallelujah. We just sang hallelujah. What we're really saying in Hebrew is this line right here, praise the Lord. But did you notice how the psalm ends? His praises endure forevermore. And so whatever the psalm is about, it's bookended by the command to praise the Lord and the reality that even if you don't, his praises will still continue forever and ever and ever. In other words, the psalm really is about worship. Now, if you're a visual learner, then I want you to look at the psalm, this psalm, like you would look at a hamburger or a sub. Or if you, you're like me, you like desserts like a macaron, right? Am I saying it right? But you got a bread, an outer part, top and bottom, and in the middle you have a filling. Well, the outer parts of the psalm is praise. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. It's about the importance of worshiping the Lord. But there's more. Notice that the, the, the phrase praise the Lord, it's not a question. It's not saying, well, will you go and praise him? It's not a suggestion. It's not a, I encourage you to go and praise him. The way that it's written, it is a command where he is commanding the hearers of this psalm to praise him. Now, when you think about this definition of praise, a word that is really close to it as a fair translation is the word eulogize. Now, when you hear eulogy, you probably think of that part in funerals when someone has died and some people come up and they share good things about the person. They did this and they did that and they were like this. And I remember this time and they did this. And what you're doing in a eulogy is testifying in the company of many of the goodness of the deceased. Well, it's possible to eulogize the living. It's what happens when a coach gives a game ball to a player. When a cheerleading coach makes a certain person on the team the captain in the presence of everybody else, what we're doing when we do that is is, is letting everybody else know that for this game right here, this person had this many blocks, this many touchdowns, this many interceptions. What you're doing is you're praising that person in the company of the assembly. It's what we do when someone retires from work and we have a retirement party and we say all these accolades, these ways that they grew the company. It's what you do if you're a soldier in war and you almost died defending the, com the country and you get a, a, a purple heart. And what you do is you are publicly lost it upon and your accomplishments over here are acknowledged in front of everybody it's what you do at a wedding when you give a toast to the best your best man gives you a toast that you're eulogizing somebody who is living well here's what the author of the psalms is saying god is worth eulogizing he's worth showing up and testifying to his goodness but here's the thing if you've ever been at a toast, if you've, if you've ever eulogized somebody who's alive, you know this truth, don't you? What you hear about them is true some of the time, but it's not true all of the time. Is that fair? This soldier who may lay down his life for his company, he'd have had like two affairs, right? 
I'm just, right? This person who has done this amazing things for the company, yeah, buddy, you stepped on people's feet to get ahead, right? So on one level, whatever we hear when we eulogize other people, it's always half truths. It's never the whole story. But here's the thing about God. He doesn't have a dark side. You can never stand up and say, God is not gracious. No, the psalmist is actually saying he is always gracious. He is always kind. He is always splendid. He is always powerful. He is always covenantally faithful. He is always just. He is always merciful. He is always present. In other words, the psalmist is actually saying there is discontinuity between humans and the Lord. The Lord is not like us in the sense that he is through and through all the time, eternally himself. And so we praise him because of that. But I also love that the psalmist, after giving the command to the body to praise the Lord, he, it begins to get personal. You all praise the Lord, but then notice how the shift. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the company of the upright in the congregation. It's as if he's saying, look, I'm telling you to do it because I'm already doing it. And even if you don't do it, as for me and my house, we will. Do you see what he's saying? And then I love the next phrase, where and with whom will he do it? He tells us in the company of the upright, in the congregation. That's both a when and a where. That's, that's both a with whom and a where. Well, who will you praise the Lord with? I will praise him with the company of the upright. Well, where will you do it? I will do it when we gather together as a congregation. In other words, this isn't private worship in your own home, even though we're to do that. This isn't way of life worship where I'm offering my body as a living sacrifice. That is my reasonable worship. Yes, we do that, but that's not what this psalm is about. This psalm is about the importance, the command, the, the, the high treasure of gathering together regularly with God's people in the company of the assembly on the Lord's day to stand and testify and give his name some glory. Look, saints, there are many things that we do here on earth that does not seem to correlate neatly in heaven. I love my wife. But there is no marriage and giving in marriage in heaven. And I don't know what that means. We birth children and raise children. But there is no birthing and raising children in heaven. We evangelize and do missions right now. There is no evangelism in heaven. And furthermore, we don't know a lot about heaven. Will we drive cars? Will we phase places like Jesus did and just kind of show up 50 miles north when the, those guys are swimming? I mean, fishing? We, we don't know. We don't know how old we'll be in heaven. What, what, what is aging like there? We, we don't know. The Bible leaves these things mysterious. But you want to know what's repeated over and over again that's going to be happening in heaven? We're going to be worshiping. We're going to be with angels and archangels and living creatures, whoever they are, and elders and the cloud of witnesses that have gone on before us with people from every nation and tribe and tongue bowing before the Lamb. Beloved, when Jesus taught his disciples to pray, we pray that will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And we will spend eternity worshiping and enjoying the Lord. I think that kind of means that it's important right now. So disbelieve the lies that creep in that this right here is unimportant. That this right here, gathering together, is inconsequential. 
that it doesn't matter. Do what you want to do on a Sunday. Do what you want to do. Go where you want to go. Be who you want to be with. And the scriptures seem to be saying, no, like th this is it. Being somewhere gathered with God's people on the day that he gives us to rest. It is one of our highest blessings. Which moves us to the second point. I love this about the Lord. He knows at our core, one, that we're forgetful. Two, he knows that sometimes we're like kids. You ever had a kid and they go through the why phase? You can't go outside, why? You gotta go to bed at nine, why? You gotta go take a bath, why? You can't run in the street, why? It's just why, 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 right? Well, we're like that with God. He commands worship and he knows deep down inside there's this thing of why is it important? And that's what God does in the next point. He gives us reasons to worship him. And that's what I want to look at in verses two through nine. So Psalm 111 shares a similar structure as the other hallelujah psalms. So if you, you don't have to turn there, but if you were to turn to Psalm 146 through Psalm 150, the last five psalms in the Psalter, you'll notice a pattern. All of those psalms begin with praise the Lord. And all of those psalms end with what? Praise the Lord. And then all of those psalms have some text in the middle. And here is an interpretive clue. When you see a psalm that's bookended by praise, praise him, praise him. What is the relationship to the meat in the middle of our sandwich? The meat in the middle tells us what or how to do what God is commanding or reasons why we ought to do what God is commanding. And so this psalm is commanding worship. Well, verses two through nine tell us why. There are two major reasons God is worthy of worship in this text. They are his divine attributes and his divine works. Now, when I say attribute, what do I mean? John Frame in his systematic theology, he writes that the attributes are adjectives or nouns that describe what God is like. The attributes reveal his lordship. He goes on to say, for simplicity, just to be simple, let's think about the attributes of God under three headings. The heading of love, the heading of knowledge, and the heading of power. And under the heading of love, you obviously have God's love, but you have uh, other attributes that emanate from his love, like his goodness, like his grace, like his covenant, like his faithfulness, like his righteousness, like his justice, and of course, love itself. And God's goodness is his general uh, benevolence to all people, even those outside of his covenant. God's grace is usually the gift of salvation or deliverance apart from the works of his people. God's righteousness and justice are legal terms indicating that his conduct measures up to the highest standards, even his own, of fairness and equity. His faithfulness means that he is loyal to his own word. His love means that an unwavering emotional fondness for his people and sometimes his enemy all the time. Under the attributes of knowledge, we list truth and wisdom and special revelation. So the giving of the precepts of God come under the broader attribute of knowledge. Under the attribute of power, you have God's omnipotence. Who can stay God's hand? He does what he pleases. Now, there are some things he can't do. He can't lie, right? He can't sin because that's contrary or contradictory to his holiness. And so logically, he can't go against who he really is. But the emphasis here is that God's attributes of love, of knowledge and power. Now, lay that on top of this psalm. And the psalmist says in verse four, the Lord is gracious, dealing with us better than we deserve. The Lord is merciful, not giving us what we deserve. The Lord is covenantal. He will keep his end of the covenant and your end for you in Jesus. The works of his hand are faithful and just. These all emanate from his love. And look at his precepts. That, that's the, the, the attribute of knowledge. His precepts, these are his command, his revealed words, right? He, he discloses truth. Do you see? The psalmist is calling us to worship the Lord on account of his attributes. 
But here's where the rubber hits the road. The word that's mentioned most in this song is the word work. And this is not your works. Your works, our works, are going to come out of Psalm 112. In Psalm 111, it's about the God's works, things he has done. And so notice verse 3, full of splendor and majesty is his work. Verse 2, great are the works of the Lord. Verse 4, he has caused his wondrous works to be remembered. Verse 6, he has shown his people the power of his works. Verse 7, the works of his hand are faithful and just. The picture that services about our God from this text is he's not lazy. He's not detached. He's a working God, always at work. This is why Jesus in John chapter 5, when he healed a man on the Sabbath and the Jews were persecuting him because they thought he violated the Sabbath, he replied, my father is working until now and I am doing his work. I'm entering into his work. Jesus is telling them, do you really think God takes a break on the Sabbath? He rested in the beginning as a pattern for you, but your God doesn't rest. He doesn't need sleep. He doesn't grow tired. He doesn't grow weary. He doesn't need to go take a time out and get his strength back. No, he gave a Sabbath day of rest for us so that as we trust him in rest, he can hold the world together. He can mend your hearts. The Spirit goes out on the Sabbath and rescues souls. He gives courage to the faint-hearted. God doesn't need a break. God doesn't take a break. He's a working God. And here's where the rubber hits the road, saints. That third attribute, God's power, his omnipotence, his ability to do whatever he wants, and he doesn't have to run it by any of y'all or me. His ability to work in real time and space. The Lord takes his own attributes, love, grace, mercy, faithfulness, kindness, justice, holiness. And you know what he does with his power? He demonstrates it in real time and space. He's not saying, I'm gracious. No, because of his power, I'm going to show you grace. I'm he doesn't just say, I'm merciful. No, in my power, I'm going to put you in situations where you are lavish with mercy. Do you see what the psalmist is saying? And that's why verse six, six makes, verse 5 makes sense. If the Lord is gracious and merciful, what will you do to show us that you're gracious and merciful? Well, look at verse 5. He provides food for those who fear him. We probably should translate that. He provided food for those who fear him. More than likely, he's calling his original audience to remember those wilderness years when they wandered and they ate manna and quail and water and not one of them died of hunger or starvation. That was an act of his mercy and grace to them because they were grumblers. In verse 6, he gave them the inheritance of the nations. That's probably recalling when they left Egypt and went into the land of promise and they were a ragtag army and somehow they ended up getting land. Why? Because the Lord of hosts was in their midst. Look at verse 9. He sent redemption to his people. This is probably a reference to Egypt when God's people were in bondage. And God sent Moses to tell Pharaoh, let my people go that they may worship me. And so God raised up a deliverer and he brought them out from under his thumb. But then God did something more because their only problem wasn't just being in bondage to Pharaoh. They also had an inner problem and it was their own sin. And so God erects the Passover feast to enact grace to you. Yes, this animal will die and I will pardon your iniquity and you will go out free to worship me, free from under his thumb and free from the guilt of your sin. That is God's mighty redemption in this passage. And all of this flows from his attributes. 
This is why the hearers are being commanded to worship. But saints, don't we know that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever? He did great things for them. He is, has, and will do great things for you. Has he not put food on your tables? And it may be cafeteria food. And it may be food that you have to get help from the government. And it may be food that you buy and you cook. But can't we all step back and say, the Lord is continuing to provide. We sing a song here, and it's, I thank you for all that you've done this far. Thank you for being the God that you are. Thank you for food on my table. I know you're able. I want to say thank you. Where are we that we begin to presume that our next meal we have gotten by ourselves? From his hand we eat. Has not God given us a place to stay? And it may not be as big as your neighbor's house. And that's cool. But you got somewhere to lay your head. He's giving you land, giving you a place. And one day you're going to have an eternal home. Jesus has gone to prepare a place for you. And no matter what you endure in this life, you will come home to him in his father's house it's a mansion with many rooms. And it doesn't matter your quality of life right now. I promise you, in the end, you will make it home. And has not God worked his mighty hand for our redemption? You see, all of us at one point were by nature children of wrath. We were at one point following the course of this world. I'm ashamed of who I used to be and what I did with my time and my body and my money and my thoughts and God in his kindness like he, he reaches down according to his grace and he just rescues his people and so when you look at the news and you see murderers and perjurers and thieves don't you dare be arrogant that that was you outside of the grace of the Lord. That God snatched you through the mighty prophet greater than Moses. Through the ministry of the word. That his grace fell fresh upon your heart. And you bowed the knee to King Jesus. And God in Jesus has atoned for all of your sins. You see we gather to worship in response to all that God has done and all that God is doing and all that God will do. The only reason in time you can cease to worship the Lord is when he ceases to be gracious and work for you. And because he's never ever going to stop working for his people, his people should never ever ever not honor and worship him. He is worthy. Which moves us to the last point. Like we're commanded to worship. And we're given reasons to worship. And you realize that. God even works to assist you to worship him. If you're struggling here. To worship. Struggling to see the importance of worship. This psalm says. Hey. Just show up. Just go. Why? Because God is at work. Just enter into the company of the upright over time. And God will work on your heart. If you're plagued by the guilt that I'm not worshiping the Lord with my whole heart. Remember two things. What God has done for you in Jesus. And what God has done in you through Jesus. What has God done for you through the cross? I love these little vignettes that we get of Jesus, right? When he was a boy, his family left him. And he was where? At the temple talking about God. And then you read the Gospels. And on the Lord's Day, you see this pattern. Where did Jesus go? He went to the synagogue. Why does Jesus need to go to the synagogue? What can any preacher teach the son of glory? 
He's not going there because he needs some rabbi to teach him. He's going there as the God man because he loved the Lord. And he loved the Lord's people. And he loved that the Lord would meet him there. And here's the thing. That righteousness is accrued to you. We're wayward. We're divided. But our Savior was never. And what God did was put him on a cross to die for our divided hearts. And what he credits to your account is this love and longing to worship him. That's what he's done for you. He's also done something in you. The prophets write about the new heart that God is going to give people. And so it used to be mama got to drag me to church and daddy got to make me get up and go to church. And I got to set the alarm clocks for everybody to get us to go to church. But that is not the new heart. The new heart that God gives is, let me get my clothes ready on Sunday, not Saturday night. Let me set my own clock because I'm ready to enter into the house of the Lord. And here's the thing. When Jesus saves you, the Holy Spirit gives you that heart. Where we long to and want to and find delight in. And if you ever forget that worship is important. Fret not. Look at verse 4. He causes his wondrous works to remember, to be remembered. You see that? He's going to do it. This is such good news if you have a wayward spouse, a wayward friend, or wayward children. Right? We kind of think we got to make them remember. And here's what God says. Yeah, you pray. But that ain't even your work. That's my work. And that's why Luke 15 is in the Bible. You have a son who dwelled in the father's house, who decides that he's wiser than the father and wants to go chase the world. And he goes and explores the world. And then one day he remembers how it was in my father's house. And he goes back. Do you see what God is saying? I'm covenantally faithful. I cause my works to be remembered. You pray and you watch me. Make that child remember. I'll do it. I'll close with this. As we do this over time, saints, we're changed. But that change begins, as the psalm tells us, with a proper and holy reverence of the Lord. If the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, you want to be wise, reverence him. Guess what the beginning of reverence is? Worship. Do you see the relationship? You want to revere the Lord and be wise? Well, what comes in front of the fear of the Lord? This psalm says worship. As you see his attributes on display, as you hear about his character, as you experience his goodness, that makes us revere him. And as we begin to revere him, we grow in wisdom. And so the foundation of wisdom is worship. Let's pray. Father, would you bless your people? Would you give us eyes to see all that you have done, are doing, will do, and are up to? May we find ourselves, Lord, offering our bodies as reasonable sacrifices to you. May we find ourselves, Lord, sneaking away in moments of the day to adore you. But Father, may we also uh, commit ourselves to being in God's house with God's people over time that you might receive our praise and build us up in the faith. We pray this in your name. Amen.